And now we have the uh, last talk of the, of the first session on uh, production of interstellar molecules by proton bombardment of ices. And the talk to be given by Reggie Hudson. Thanks very much. Thank you for changing that. I was starting to feel Canadian there for a minute. Good. Uh, we've heard some very good talks. Well, I could, I could listen to these for a long time. These, and, and I hang around with these people. I don't know about you. And it's, uh, it's all been very good. Anyway, I hope to uh, continue that. And I'm, I'm aware of the time. I've been in this situation before. I used to teach college. And so I know what happens when you get too close to the lunch hour. So I'll try to be careful here and stay on time. And so I have to make sure if you can see this laser, that laser is about, uh, about dad, I think. So anyway, I'll, I'll do what I can. I may have to walk to the screen once or twice to point out things here. Anyway, thanks for sticking around. The, the, uh, the two parts of the word astrochemistry, or astro and chemistry, I, I don't know everybody in the audience here. I know a lot of you, and I know there are a lot of astronomers here, and there are a handful of chemists here. Usually when I talk to a chemistry audience, I have to spend a lot of time on the left-hand side of this picture. I can't see that laser, so I don't know if you can see it or not. But I have to spend a lot of time on the left-hand side when I talk to uh, chemistry students. And when I talk to astronomers, it's more the right-hand side I have to talk to people about. Here comes the, oh, wonderful. Thank you. I owe you. OK, great, great. Now we've got some uh, something. Anyway, when I talk to astronomy people, I talk to some of these things over here. And, and astronomers call these. What, what do we call them? Coms? Is that it? COMs? And if, if, you, if you call these a COM and you go to an American chemical society meeting, boy, you'll just get laughed out of the room. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, boy. Or if you go to a biochemistry meeting, they'll just say, Shh, that's, that's, you know, these are. But these are hard for us. These are complicated molecules for us in, in, in many ways. And so I'm going to start out sort of like uh, one of the previous speakers did here. I'm going to start out with a, a, a quotation. This is a a session, a organization here, National Academy of Sciences. I thought I would uh, pull up a National Academy of Science astronomer here and to see what he says about chemistry. This is Dr. Jesse Greenstein from Caltech, I believe Caltech. He uh, died some years ago as a National Academy member. And here's what he said about, about chemistry. A pride I had when I was a young astronomer was chemistry had nothing to do with astronomy. Now, I, I think Dr. Greenstein is one of these people that enjoyed a nice laugh occasionally, so I think he would uh, probably laugh at the, the fact that uh, we're all here now talking about all these cool molecules and things like that. He seems to be a very interesting fellow. I've never met him. I met his son, but I've never met, uh, I've never met Dr. Greenstein. And wait, there's more, as they say on TV. The, the last part of this that I took out was the last two words were, thank God <laughs> that there's no chemistry involved in astronomy. But uh, during Dr. Greenstein's lifetime, this all changed, of course. You saw the graph that had the chronology, had the number of uh, astronomical detections of, of molecules has been increasing. There, there's something on the order of 200 or so now that, that have been found. And so I think he would uh, probably enjoy hearing the, the sort of things that we're talking about today. Uh, one of the previous speakers, Dr. Michael McCarthy, said that, that he, he works at the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical something something. And he, he said he could only find the North Star. So that made me think, he, he's the chair, the president of the world's largest organization of astrochemists. And if he could only find the North Star, maybe I'd just better back up for 30 seconds here. <laughs> the previous chair sitting behind him. So uh, two, two stops behind him. So uh, just, just uh, to think about this for a minute here, 200 or so astronomical molecules and a handful of molecular ices that we have. Uh, the object at the top is a comet. I think somebody showed this picture, Comet Yakutake. And there are a few dozen molecules that have been detected in comets now. All of these have been claimed at one time or another as being in the frozen state. Uh, a comet is about the size, of the original comet is about the size of Washington, D.C. and the Beltway. If you can imagine the big Beltway around D.C., that's what a comet starts out as, way the heck past Pluto, like 50,000 times farther from the sun than you are right now. And then when a comet's orbit brings it in, it begins to outgas. And the, uh, the icy material, the organic material on the surface of the comet begins to sublime away, and you get this beautiful halo. So this thing up here that you see, the blue thing, the, uh, the actual extent of this, I don't know, but it could, easily be, it could easily be halfway between here and the sun. I mean, this thing is gigantic. You know, from the t tip here to over here, maybe, maybe 50 million miles. Make it kilometers, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, this, this thing is gigantic compared to uh, what it starts out as, which is the size of Chicago or New York or something like that. In contrast, though, th this thing here at the bottom, which really does look like a black hole to me. It's not a black hole. But this dark thing, I think you've seen about four or five times this morning, this dark nebula, this is fantastically larger than this thing up here. 
this, this, uh, the dot that I have, the green laser dot that's showing there, uh, our solar system on the scale here, our solar system would easily fit into that green dot. Okay, so this thing is terrifically large compared to this thing up here. It only looks black because it's, because it's cold and we don't have infrared eyes. If you have infrared eyes, you can see into this thing and you see this uh, terrific number of molecules that all the other speakers have talked about in the gas phase and a handful of ice phase molecules as well. Some of the ones you see in the ice phase are listed here. You'll notice that the top and the bottom sets of molecules are very similar. And that's because we think that when you look at a comet, you're looking at things that are on the edge of the solar system from which the solar system may have formed in the so-called interstellar medium. So this is uh, a way, this is the closest way that we can visit this part out here, the closest thing we can get to visiting the interstellar regions without going there, the closest thing we have is to go to a comet. And we can't go to the interstellar medium, these uh, fantastic regions you've been hearing about, protoplanetary disk and things like that. We can't visit those. It's all remote sensing. So how do we find information about these things? And this is the tip to my employer. As taxpayers, you should know that we uh, pay a fair amount of money and attention to these uh, things in space by way of uh, missions like the, the Stardust mission to retrieve material from a comet. The next one's the terrifically successful Pluto mission, New Horizons. The Cassini mission to go to Saturn and Saturn's moons, which just uh, went down into, finished up last year. I'm, I'm not supposed to say crash, right? It did not crash into Saturn. It was a controlled descent down into Saturn. <laughs> crash means something else. Uh, the Mars rovers, the Mars rovers you'll probably hear about tomorrow. Uh, you know, just finding the first organic molecules for, I don't know, Danny, 30 or 40 years, people thought no organics on Mars. It turns out there are some organics on Mars, and I think you'll probably hear about this soon. And of course, traditional telescopes on hilltops, the largest steerable object on the Earth. I was at the Naval Academy, and I said the largest steerable object, and I think the midshipmen were ready to chase me out of the room because they say the largest steerable object is an aircraft carrier. Okay, you're forewarned here. The f iconic space telescope and finally the poor person's astronomy program is uh, meteorites. If you can't go to space, wait for space to come to you. And again, you'll hear a lot of th interesting things about meteorites, I think, tomorrow. So these are ways that we can find these things, but when I talk about ices, we're, we're much more limited. We can't go into the interstellar regions to look at ices. And what we have to do is it's all remote sensing, all chemical theory, all chemical experiments. You can't actually visit those regions in space. And so we use infrared telescopes on hilltops, things like this, the infrared telescope facility, a NASA facility. That's to get above. We put it on a hilltop to get above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere. If that's not enough, you put your telescope in a jet plane and fly it above even more of the water in the atmosphere. And if that's not enough, you spend a lot of money and put your infrared detector in a telescope and put it above the Earth's atmosphere entirely. And so these are three different instruments that you can use to obtain infrared spectra, these very distant, very interesting objects. The one down here on the left is the spectrum of Pluto. The one on the right is an interstellar object. I believe that's W33A, a protostellar object. It doesn't really matter what they are. I'm not going to show you much astronomical data. I just want to illustrate that you can get infrared spectra of these distant objects, whether it's inside the solar system or whether it's outside the solar system. You can get IR spectra. just like if you were to take a, a, a course in organic chemistry at uh, Johns Hopkins University or Georgetown or someplace where you study organic chemistry and you, did, uh, you get the infrared spectra of objects. And you can do the same thing with uh, astronomical objects in space. It's a lot more expensive and much more difficult. All right, so you've seen this four times now. I think this is the, I think this is the four, fifth time you've seen this object. Uh, Bernard's 68, 15 trillion kilometers across. Uh, you've seen the temperature. People have talked about these dark clouds being cold. You don't really have liquids, gas, dust grains, ices. Someone told me I should be careful how I pronounce that if I'm in Washington, D.C., ices. I've got to be careful. It's not something in the Middle East. It's something in interstellar space. How do you have chemistry in a place like this? How do you have chemistry when it's really cold? You got gas, you got dust. You know, as chemistry people, Mike and I and Suzanne and some of us, we were raised on the liquid phase. You know, the chemistry experiments you do in college are heavily oriented toward liquids, but yet when you do astrochemistry, you can almost write liquids off. It's gases, dust grains, and ice. The energy source is thermal. We should put a big mark through thermal. Not much thermal chemistry. Some photochemistry. We can have some photochemistry, and we can have radiation chemistry. Uh, when we talk about cosmic rays, we mean actually particles. It's an old name. The name came before the composition was known. Cosmic rays, primarily hydrogen and helium ions. And the picture I have of a grain, this is the, the biggest picture of a grain I've ever seen. <laughs> 
The, the grains, interstellar grains, you've heard mentioned here, these are on the order of micron scales, micrometers, tenths of a micrometer. And we think that these things have a cold core of a silicaceous material in the middle, the black thing. And on the outside, when molecules stick on the outside, it's like, it's like what? Like uh, having a cold can of Pepsi on a humid Washington summer day when the condensation sticks on the outside of the can. And so here, water molecules stick there, or oxygens and hydrogens, and the oxygen is hydrogenated and you can have other molecules that form. Lots of chemical and physical changes, accretion, migration. You can have atoms skittering about on the, the surface. You can have desorption. Molecules get back into the gas phase where you can detect them with these fantastic instruments like ALMA and the, uh, the Green Bank facility. You can have photochemistry. A lot of things can be happening here. Not necessarily fast, but lots of things can be happening. And, and each of these things is almost a research area into itself. You know, the Journal of Organic Chemistry, uh, sorry, Journal of uh, Photochemistry, the Journal of Radiation Chemistry, uh, Surface Science is another journal. Which each one of these things is almost a research area. I'm only going to talk about one of these. I'm really only going to talk about formation of molecules in ices. That's, that's the only thing. And so I'll tell you that about 10 miles from where you're sitting in that direction, about 10 miles that direction, 15 or so kilometers, we have a laboratory in which we do molecular astronomy. We study planetary chemistry, we study interstellar chemistry, and we do some astrobiology. We have uh, quite a few infrared spectrometers. This is an infrared spectrometer. We have uh, vacuum chambers, some ultra-high vacuum, some sort of you know, good vacuum, but not super vacuum. We have energy sources to simulate photochemistry. We have electron guns. We have uh, an old-style Van de Graaff accelerator, a million electron volts, which is uh, you know, sort of I don't know, it sounds, uh, it sounds bigger than it is. A lot of cosmic rays are much more energetic than a million electron volts, but it, it turns out it really doesn't matter that much what the, the initial energy is here. This is a typical experiment. This is a cartoonish version. We start out with a, a, a substrate about the size of a coin, a quarter. Imagine a quarter, a one euro coin. We have this in a vacuum chamber suspended, attached to a refrigeration system. We cool this thing down to something like 10 Kelvin and we grow an ice on top of the surface. We can bounce an infrared beam off of this and re record a spectrum, spectrum down here on the left-hand side. We can move this thing 180 degrees. This is not very dignified, but I'm going to move. Instead of uh, pointing that way to get an infrared spectrum, we turn the sample and we rotate it 180 degrees and we expose it to our cosmic ray simulation source, our Van de Graaff, and then we rotate it back again and look at the difference in the spectra. Lots of different types of experiments you can do with this. You can do you can do UV visible spectroscopy, you can do mass spectrometry, you can do desorption measurements, a lot of different types of things. But this is the basic layout. The, uh, I don't know if you can see the blue lines or not. Can you see the blue lines? Yeah, I was talking to an elementary school student one group one time and I had something like this. And one of them asked me if the blue lines are the vacuum chamber. And do I really have holes in my vacuum chamber? <laughs> got to love these elementary school students. Okay, we do not have holes in the vacuum chamber if we can help it. Okay, this is just a schematic is all it is. I put some of the temperature pressure conditions up there on top. Uh, radiation, I feel like I always want to say something about radiation. The, uh, the radiation that comes in, it creates lots of secondary electrons, as Dr. Herp said in the, uh, the opening talk for this part of the session here. And it's the secondary electrons which do most of the chemistry. It's not really the first thing that comes in that creates all the different products. It's really the secondary electrons that help create all those products. And I tried to come up with a good analogy that's semi-dignified, and I can't. So I'll come up with this one. Suppose that we, someone tossed a stink bomb into this room. I think most of us would leave. We'd rush out the door, and the staff of the hotel, the security people, would see a bunch of people going out. Okay, now, suppose that we had a family of skunks that came into the room. Most of us would rush out the door <laughs> in the same way. And the people out in the lobby out here would see that, would know something's going on, but they wouldn't know exactly what the instigator was. And that's the key point here in this analogy. The instigator here, the initiator, it, it can be quickly overwhelmed. Its identity can be hidden by all the different chemical changes that you get along these radiation tracks over here. Sort of makes sense. It's very difficult to distinguish between the chemistry of a cosmic ray that's a proton versus a helium ion or even an electron. It's very hard to distinguish because all we see is that one snapshot in time when we get a spectrum from ALMA or ISO or whatever's in between, you know, JWST in the future, we get one snapshot of what the object looks like. And so we can't really extrapolate backwards to this stage here. We can just say we've got cosmic rays, we get energy changes, we get uh, chemical changes. 
Uh, the types of chemical changes, just quickly, uh, we get excited water molecules. If it's a water, water molecule we hit, you get dissociation, hydrogen, ion, hydrogen atoms, hydroxyl radicals, and you can get uh, also ionizations. The, uh, the actual, actually the change here is this is very similar, I guess is uh, again what Dr. Herb said, instead of H2, I've got H2O. It's a very similar type of reaction. We have a proton transfer to give you hydronium. Most of the, uh, the average energy of electrons is only in the realm of 10 eV, and so uh, 10 eV, that's getting down to the realm of photochemistry. So there's really not much difference in the ultimate final products that you get between radiation chemistry and photochemistry. I showed you the equipment there, you know, sure, whenever we have our Van de Graaff, we have to leave, we can't stay when it's running, we can't go in the room, it's like these, what, like dental x-rays, you know, you get the dental x-ray, and they say lean back, close your eyes, we'll put the apron on you, and then you open your eyes and there's this x-ray thing pointed at your head, you know, something like that. Okay, it's, it's you know, we, we can't stay in the room, you know, we, we can't get constant exposure, so we have to be outside the room when we're running our radiation experiments, but uh, by and large, we don't make any radioactive material. It's nothing, nothing like that, not radiochemistry, not nuclear chemistry. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you mainly about this one thing up here. That's the introduction, and so I'm going to tell you about a few examples of what we can do, and I hope to show you and tell you some of the things we can't do. I'm always suspicious when speakers have all the answers, and so I want to make sure that you know that we don't have all the answers. You know, it's, it's, it's not a closed field or something like that. This is an early laboratory study. This reaction here, this uh, conversion has already been mentioned. I think it was the first talk of the day, going from carbon monoxide to methanol. And we thought we could probably promote this by using radiation chemical methods because we knew radiation chemistry produces hydrogen atoms. And all we have to do, all we have to do is cool the sample down and make it out of water and CO and turn on the radiation source and we're on our way. And it turns out this is the path to going from CO over to methanol at the end here. And I think I circled that. Yes, I did. You might be able to see the circle here, the, uh, the red circle for methanol. So this was sort of the goal. And, and for a long time, this was the only way that we could actually get this uh, methanol molecule over here in a reasonable abundance. We didn't know of any other way we could make this other than radiation paths. And I'm not sure, I'm still not sure even to this day that this is the exact path. There may be ions involved in this. I'm not quite sure about that. Another product that we have down here on the bottom is carbon dioxide. This is an easy way to make carbon dioxide, to take hydroxyl radicals and combine it with CO, and you can pop it right over to CO2. So right away when we did this reaction, when we did this uh, set of experiments, we knew that we could make two important molecules, CO2 and we could make methanol at low temperatures. This is 10K. You know, we're not talking about liquids or anything like that. I told this to a retired chemist from DuPont one time. I said, we can make CO, convert over CO to methanol, and his, his answer or response was something like, so? So what? You know, because DuPont and other chemical companies, Monsanto and so forth, these, these big chemical companies carry out reactions like this, but it's at high pressures, high temperatures, and we're talking about low temperatures, you know, essentially no overpressure that you have. So it's a very different chemical situation. And if you've got methanol, what can you do with methanol? So here's a prediction we made back uh, a good long time ago now. Prediction we made, we knew that methanol could be uh, converted over to methoxy, hydroxy methyl radicals, and all they've got to do is couple, and we can make ethylene glycol, the component of antifreeze. So we predicted that you would find in an ice, you would find antifreeze. <laughs> this was the prediction. And it was confirmed by some of our friends at the National Radio Astronomical Observatory just a few years later. And again, you've already seen this picture, Comet Hellbop, that's down here. Uh, Comet Hellbop, it's also been found that Comet Hellbop has ethylene glycol. So we felt pretty good about this. We then, so what, what is what the word, motivated, excited about this to, uh, to, uh, to make another prediction. That was that we could predict what would happen to methyl cyanide if you have a methyl cyanide molecule in ice. And you heard about methyl cyanide in one of the previous talks. Uh, you can get an isomerization to make ketanamine. I don't think we were the first ones to predict that. I think there's probably people in this room that may have predicted this too. You can, you can push uh, one of the hydrogen atoms on the methyl group over to the other end of the molecule, to the nitrogen, and you can actually get this uh, very unstable molecule, ketanamine, predicted 2004. It was observed in 2006 for the first time in uh, Sagittarius 2b, I think it was. I think that's right. Anyway, so again, you make predictions, and if, if the predictions are verified, that doesn't mean necessarily that your initial thinking was, was correct. But it sort of gives you confidence that maybe you're on the right track. You need uh, maybe more than one of these. Uh, another one we were involved in was the, uh, the so-called cyanate wars of the, uh, the early part of the 20th century, late early part of the 
early part of the 21st century, late 20th century. This is the conversion of cyanide over into cyanate. There were lots of arguments about this back in the 1990s about whether this was possible. And the reason was because of a feature in the infrared spectrum of many of these protostellar objects that's at 4.65 micrometers, and it seems to be at the same position as the cyanate anion. And after a lot of work, and I mean you know, a decade of work, we were able to finally show that it would take an act of Harry Potter to predict, pre prevent this from happening, and that essentially anything that you have that has hydrogen and CO and nitrogen in it is going to go over and form the cyanate anion. So this is an example of actual data we have. So this is a spectrum of methyl cyanide. You turn on the radiation beam, this peak up here, the parapeaks, the parapeaks begins to drop down, and you see a cyanate band form over here. And so this is in, this is in uh, a large number of interstellar objects, and I think it's known, I think this is true, it's, it was one of the first, maybe the first polyatomic anion, sorry, polyatomic ion found outside the galaxy. I don't know if it was the very first, but it was one of the very first found outside the galaxy. So cyanate's very, very common. Uh, the, the war ended, and of course you can tell which side I'm on because I'm telling the story. Okay. Another one uh, point I would make here is that one of the interesting things about interstellar astrochemistry is that you can make things and you can find things in the laboratory and in space that are difficult to make and find by ordinary conventional chemistry. And I'm not going to have time to go through a bunch of these, so I'll just say you know, carbonic acid is one that we found about 10 miles from here. And a generation, what am I saying, a century of chemistry students were taught that you can't get carbonic acid. And yet it was found about 10 miles up the road here by a physicist and astronomer. They weren't chemists, so they didn't know you weren't supposed to be able to make this. The unbiased physicist and astronomer ended up with carbonic acid here. Within a year, it was in a Walt Disney movie. <laughs> so I don't know if we were in competition with Disney or not. But uh, it, the carbonic acid is one of these things you're not supposed to be able to make and isolate. Now, you all have it in you right now. If you don't have carbonic acid in your bloodstream, please see me afterwards because I have a few hundred questions I want to ask you. But we do have carbonic acid, but to make it and isolate it is something very different. And it turns out it's not that unusual a molecule. It's just that we live in a world that's about whatever it is out here, 60 Fahrenheit or something. If we lived in a world 60 below zero, we'd see carbonic acid all over the place. It's just unstable at room temperature. Uh, another one's this, to convert a triple bond with carbon to a triple bond with carbon and oxygen, that's quite a feat. A and this one puzzled us for a while, but it didn't puzzle us so much that we dropped everything to solve the problem. So acetylene, well known in comets, it's a cometary molecule, acetylene. Uh, the experiment was acetylene water, low temperatures, you convert it over to vinyl alcohol, another molecule they told us for 100 years we couldn't make. Vinyl alcohol goes to ketene and goes to CO. Uh, vinyl alcohol, the local story here is that the chemists in Europe were saying that you can't make vinyl alcohol, you can't isolate it. It doesn't exist. You try to do this on an organic chemistry test, and you write this down, and they tell you to change your major to theater or philosophy or journalism or something or another. And you're, not, you're not chemistry, you're not science material, because everybody knows this doesn't form. But it does, it can, in laboratories and in interstellar space where it's really, really cold. You can trap things that are unstable under the conditions of this room. So it took a long time to go through this and to, to work this out. The number of people have verified this since. And the, uh, the ketene molecule is quite interesting. It's a known interstellar and cometary molecule. It goes over to CO on a radiation. And so when we first tried to do this and record the spectra of this to get proof of this, it was just impossible to do because the infrared bands of ketene and CO are just like they're on top of each other. I mean, you can't separate them. And this, this worries me a little bit sometimes at night when I'm thinking not doesn't worry me too much. But I sometimes worry that the CO abundances we're reporting are corrupted by the presence of ketene. I don't know. Maybe JWST will give us the resolution we need to, uh, to work that out. And so the way we solved this was, uh, we, uh, to be frank, in front of the taxpayers, we spent a fair amount of money is the way we did this. And we bought isotopically labeled acetylene, carbon-13 isotopically labeled, which I, I don't think you can buy anymore. And I have some. If anybody needs some, we can talk. But I do have a, a, a supply of uh, isotopic. And if you go through the same experiment, what happens when you get over to here, the spectra of the two things are slightly different. And they're different enough that you can see one versus the other. And you can actually see the two products that you end up. And I can't, I don't think I can do I should have a movie of this. So what happens is as you carry out the reaction at the low temperatures, what you're seeing is that acetylene on a grain in the presence of water and cosmic rays or UV light can push over to ketene. So the ketene, which way is it? The ketene goes up. And then as it's used up, it begins to go down, and the other molecule comes up. I think I can do that. 
It's sort of like a touchdown. Touchdown by a referee who's not certain. Well, what the heck, just show you. There it is. Key team molecule comes up, and you can't quite tell, but it's getting smaller up here. And this is about where we stopped because the astronomers were telling us that if we went any higher in dose than this, we were not being realistic. You know, this is getting to be a few EV per molecule per water molecule. And so we stopped up in here, but you can see that the CO is keeping on, uh, it keeps rising up here. Now, why ketene? Ketene is what we call a gateway molecule. From ketene, you can make lots of other things. You can make, you know, acetone, you can make methyl acetate, you can make acetic acid. This has been known a long time. And you can make acetamide. Can you make peruvonitrile? That one's not known yet. If you're an infrared astronomer, a radio astronomer, a microwave astronomer, uh, this would be an interesting one to look for. I'd, I'd love to see this one formed here. This would be a very nice one here. So I'll just leave it at that. Not just a gateway molecule for interstellar space, but for the solar system. If you can make ketene, combine it with formaldehyde, which is very well known, you can get over to pyruvate and make lots of other things like alanine and glycolic acid and lactic acid and some of these other things that are here. So it's one of these molecules you like to see a way to its formation because once you can form the ketene from something simple like acetylene, there are lots of other things that you can make from it. I'm, uh, how am I doing for time here? Who's the timekeeper? Two to five minutes? Okay, yeah. So uh, I wasn't sure if Brett McGuire was going to be here. I, I thought I some, saw a name tag over here. So I wanted to mention a discovery that was reported last year, I think it was, two years ago, in Science Magazine. And this is a, a very important one and a very nice one. And this is the, uh, the discovery, the announcement of interstellar uh, propylene oxide. This was discovered by Brett McGuire and some other people, uh, Jeff Blake and some others associated with the National Radio Observatory. Uh, this is a very nice molecule here. It's chiral, and that means that there's one atom in the molecule. This, this one right here, this, mo this atom in the molecule is connected to four different things. And in terms of the, the way that organic chemists think about this, that means that the molecule cannot be superimposed on its mirror image. And that's important because in biology, the amino acids inside you, the amino acids except for glycine, have the same sort of property, and the sugars inside you have the same sort of property. This was the first one found in interstellar space. And so we kind of scratched our heads, said, how do you make this? And then we went back to our textbooks, and we realized that all you need is uh, propylene, which is an interstellar molecule, propylene, and you need a source of oxygen. And you've got CO2. We've got lots of CO2 in the interstellar medium, or comets. And so all you have to do is a radiation experiment involving CO2 and propylene. You put the two together, and you've got, well, you've got a mess is what you've got. And you've got lots of molecules. You've got this thing here called an epoxide. That's the propylene oxide and lots of other products out here. And I show this one not because it's a very nice result. I, I think it's a nice result for what we did, but especially what um, Brett McGuire and Jeff and others did. I think it's a very nice result to show that you've actually got an interstellar chiral molecule, the first one. It's always nice to, to, uh, to find the first of its type. I, th I think it's very nice, but it also I'm, I'm going to use this as, as the, uh, the sort of the limit, the end of what I'm going to say, because I think this is sort of the limit of what we can identify. The bands that we look at compared to what what Mike or someone was looking at earlier, the bands we look at in the infrared spectrum are very, very broad. They're not these parts per million things. And this is just what nature gives you. The spectrometer salespeople come to us and tell us about the wonderful resolution of the spectrometers. We don't care because the bands we're looking at, nature says that they're big and broad. We care about the speed of the spectrometer, but we don't necessarily care about the resolution. We can't use high resolution. It's just not realistic. And so the bands are broad. Being able to sort out all these things is very difficult. We haven't sorted out all these. We sorted out about half of them. But you can easily form propylene oxide, the chiral molecule, and this is probably the 10 atom limit for what we can, we can do right now. Other than this, you have to keep on going. I, I just thought I'd throw up a spectrum. It's uh, hard to see. This is propylene here. You start the irradiation, you go downward, and you can see a little bump here, a few little bumps, and the reference spectrum is there. So I'm not going to have time to go into this one, but this was a tough one. This took us a long time. And, of course, we gave it to a student. When I started this work, it wasn't obvious that you could get any reactions in ices that you could see by remote sensing in the interstellar medium or anywhere. But now, after 20 or so years, there's a wide variety of chemical reactions that have been reported for these interstellar objects, interstellar uh, icy materials, oxidations, reductions, and all the other ones up here. I don't think I've given an example of every one. But you can find examples of every one of these types of reactions, even the weird ones down here, disproportionation. That's probably not a word you're going to hear hanging around McDonald's over here. Lots of different types of reactions. It's, it's uh, no question about it now. 
the, uh, the last money slide, just say that uh, why astrochemistry? You know, astrochemistry, we do what a lot of scientists do. We take the obser observed information and we try to work backwards. We go backwards to the precursors and seek an explanation. We do lots of explanations, lots of it. The harder one is to go forward and do predictions. That, that turns out to be much harder to, uh, to predict the unobserved molecules or unobserved effects, unobserved phenomena. It's what, uh, what I think a lot of scientific fields uh, follow. Explain the known, predict the new, and it's for astronomical observations, for, uh, I don't know what, knowledge, and also for the NASA space missions that we're involved in, some of us are involved in. Okay, so I uh, thank my colleagues, a uh, bunch of names here. Most of you don't recognize the names, so you wouldn't recognize our pictures. Uh, some gals here, uh, young women. Most of the uh, women here, you don't know them, so you wouldn't recognize their names. And so I've had uh, the good fortune of being associated with a lot of good people. The U.S. taxpayers have supported me. My former employer, Eckerd College, supported me for a long time, too. Thanks to all of you. See our webpage.